Why struggle through a post-merger integration when you can glide through it? Why deal with the PMI integration challenges when you can overcome them even before they occur? Why move slow when you can move at pace? What are the world's leading PMI experts doing right now to achieve profit accelerating integrations? This podcast will give you all the answers to these questions and many more. My name is Dudley Peacock and welcome to the 100 Days and Beyond podcast. Welcome to another episode of 100 Days and Beyond, um, the podcast that is dedicated to to the mergers and acquisitions um, sphere, the, the space in which companies are purchased, uh, companies are carved out of other companies, uh, Businesses are separated into multiple pieces, but every time, every time something like that happens, there's a there's an, an immense amount of work that has to take place. There is, there's really just, uh, I don't know, how, it, it's very very difficult to explain in in a very short space of time. But essentially, what happens is you have a whole load of leaders and people of uh, of, of different backgrounds, of, of, uh, of different skill sets and specialities. Uh, various people coming from from different uh, aspects of either the acquiring business or the, the target business, and and getting them to work and getting them to work together um, and getting them to to, to act um, in in the right way. Today we are, we were meant to have uh, JP Vidya. Um, I think he's having a few technical issues. I'm going to wait a few more minutes uh, for him, uh, and barring that, I think we'll probably. Um, just quickly go through a few points around uh, M&A um, and also uh, probably more around the post-merger integration or post-acquisition integration space. Uh, and and then we'll leave it at that for the weekend uh, and then we'll pick it up with JP again uh, probably next week. But uh, to those of you that, that have joined, thank you very much. Uh, I look forward to having a, a quite a, a, a reasonable and a very short, probably, episode today. But what I would like to just maybe just go into, and that is um, that is something that I've, I've noticed in in this specific space. And I want to I want to mention it specifically because there are, are, are so many types of practitioners, so many different types of industry. If you look at from SaaS to the, the, the software as a service, if you like, to your fintechs and, and all the tech-based businesses, through to engineering or your more legacy-type businesses, agriculture, uh, energy, industrials, etc. Uh, if you look across many of those uh, of those arenas, we have a constant shift of the market. And we have a constant shift of, of the, way, the way that things are working and the way that things are operating, and, and especially now that we're looking at um, I think they're even talking about doubling the uh, the interest rates <laughs> overnight, um, and and that's going to cause some huge uh, disruption in, in in the marketplace. There, there's something that I want to, I want to mention. Maybe there's 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 two two aspects. To it. The one is is really about leadership, and there's so much being written about leadership, but 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 leadership and mindset and and the ability to get on with them, right? So, so when we look at uh, mergers and acquisitions, especially post-merger integration or post-acquisition integration, the, the some of the critical things that, that that have come up again and again and again, and that's this this take action type leadership, this ability to to um, to not let the things around you consume you so much that you go into paralysis. And and I think if you think about an attribute of a merger and acquisition uh, specialist or someone, especially on the on a deal-making side of things, and those people that are, are constantly looking for new opportunities, opportunities are, 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 are looking expensive these days. With leveraged buyouts and that, there are a lot of private equity firms and, and Investment firms, family offices, line it with individuals, and so on, looking for special golden nuggets out there. And I think people are becoming more picky and more choosy about it. But what what I am noticing, however, is is in in times when when it's um, 
I, I think when it's trying, I think it's in times when I, I think it looks like uh, JP has uh, joined us. It's all great news. We're going we're gonna, to uh, invite him in now. But I just want to just finish my thoughts. So in, in trying times, in, in times when, when it feels like the world is caving in and when it feels like you know, things are just not going the, the, the way we thought, true leaders don't go into paralysis. And I think there's there's so much written about leadership and about taking the lead and and about um, understanding sort of what's the best way forward and 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 what the best way forward often is just taking a decision, doing something. Um, often <laughs> I've seen it happen. In fact, uh, one of the one of the clients that I spoke to about two weeks ago, there was a huge change that was literally going to go through Parliament. Um, a new law was going to be passed within 21 days. It literally given this particular industry 21 days to respond. The, that week, that 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 client of mine, that week, he was totally consumed by the thinking around that particular problem. He, in, he just consumed. It slowed him down so much that that entire week was him himself had, had almost zero productivity. Where on the flip side, I've got clients where no matter what happens, no matter what comes flying at them every day of the week, every moment of every day, they're taking action. They're taking the lead. They, they do, uh, doing doing the leadership thing, which is you've got to lead from the front. You've got to show um, that you are out there. And and I and my and one of my mentors and and probably favorite people. He's a very controversial character, but most favorite people. I'm not going to mention his name, but I'm just going to mention something that he says always. He says that uh, uh, you must always be thinking. You may be wrong, but you must, you must never be in doubt. You know, and he says, say that to yourself, say that to your people, say that to the people around you, and especially say that to your spouse. <laughs> but you may be wrong, but you're never in doubt. And the doubt, the doubt is what creates paralysis and, we cre and slows you down from making decisions. I want to go now across to, to JP. JP's just joined us. So I'm just going to say good morning. To JP. Good morning to you. Uh, great pleasure to see you and apologies for being a bit late. No, no, no worries at all. Um, I've been. Uh, I thought I might as well start the podcast this morning. Thank you very much for for joining us, though. Much appreciate that. Um, JP is one of one of those uh, one of those guys that um, uh, are from uh, what what is known as corporate advisory, um, corporate finance and investment banking, and so on. And and I think uh, JP, you must have seen a lot of this stuff. And I'm going to just go straight into it. You know leadership and this paralysis thing that happens you know I've, I've seen it in politicians i've seen it in in management i've seen it in operational people sales people it's like something goes wrong and then things are slowed down you know it's it, like even with an acquisition when 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 there's a uh, there's a, some kind of m a work being done and you 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 year down the grapevine oh our company's up for sale what's going to happen to my job you know and, and then it's sort of then, then, then the doubts and the fears and all that start creeping in, and the difference is those that actually take control of their of their their mindset and their thinking versus those that that let things happen to them. And and I, I thought I'd just start the the episode off with that. But um, you know we're gonna we're going to your your really good uh, um, CV soon your uh, resume. So, but first, let me just tell me uh, just off the cuff. It, do you have any experience around that? I mean, have you seen that happen in, in the in marketplace? Of course, of course, uh, Lale. And it, it, it's a critical one. It's a critical, uh, you know, uh, topic uh, in the M&A world, of course, because uh, transactions do take time. It's not like in capital markets. Uh, transactions do take, do take time to think about, strategize about, and then the whole transaction uh, momentum, and then obviously afterwards. I think I'll, uh, I'll probably answer your, your question in, in, in two ways. Uh, mm. The first one, uh, you know, don't be concerned about things you can't, you can't act upon because if you can't influence them, well, that's the way it is. And then continue to, you know, drive the ship in the direction that you think is the right one. So in the m and world is, you know, pushing on. And if there are things, therefore, that you can influence, well, then do influence them. 
so uh, you know, I think that's a very good way to to make sure you you remain focused. The second topic is I would think grit. Mm. Uh, have grit, you know. Uh, don't uh, don't let hope uh, drop. And the anemone world, you know, you've got lots of picks and troughs and ups and downs. And um, and those who do succeed are the one who effectively roll up their sleeves and 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 push. And actually, that's what is really exciting about this this uh, this job. Yeah, and I think that that's what that's what defines, I think, a, a lot of the times why why people take on this as a career, um, why they take it on as as something they feel enthusiastic about there's a purpose to it there's a there's they might be you know there might be projects or they might be shorter term in terms of sort of a, it could be not a few months to a few years but it's not 50 years you know as a, you know an m a or or some kind of process takes a bit of time but it does it does sort of work its way through and and you starting again every time you go straight into the rough and tumble of it you you know you work through the through the different issues and then you come out on top and then whoop, there's another project and off you go again. And I just, I think it, you, you need a certain, you need, you need a, 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 not a certain, you need a large amount of grit <laughs> to get through that. And I think mindset does, does count um, a lot for that. So yeah, thank, that, thank you for that. I think that's a really, a really good one. <laughs> Um, yeah, so let me introduce you quickly. So JP, JP is a founding partner of Vidya and Co., corporate advisory based in London, here mm -hmm. in England. And uh, and I'm just going to quickly go through a few, piece, few parts of your summary, but I think you're going to be better uh, positioned to explain uh, sort, of, sort of what you do and, and, and how you got into it. But I mean, you, you talk here about corporate finance and investment banking with 20 plus years of experience advising senior executives at corporates, which are obviously the larger entities, and PE firms, private equity firms, on strategic issues, large and medium-sized M&A, or equity-raising transactions worth a combined 25 billion euros. I mean, that's a significant chunk of change. It's not going to fit in your back pocket. That <laughs> um, That's huge. So I'm, that's how I'm starting. And I'm, I thought maybe just you just want to sort of elaborate a bit on that, and then how did you get into this fascinating world? Yeah, with, uh, with pleasure. So I mean, listen. I've had uh, I've had a strong interest in banking and and, and finance for, for for many years and from my early ages, and uh, you know that transcribed in you know reading uh, the financial pages of newspapers, being interested in in the life of companies, being passionate about you know business innovation and and it being a force for good. And um, so it, I've. I've obviously pursued, uh, you know, um, studies in that field, in economics, in business, in finance, uh, accounting, uh, but also I think uh, it being much wider than that, uh, you know, languages and cultures and, and, and history and those topics. And the, the, way, the reason why I'm saying that is that being a banker is, is not all about Excel spreadsheets and, and numbers. It is, of course, a lot about that. But what is really fascinating about this job is that it's much more um, uh, complex and comprehensive uh, uh, in terms of um, having skill set around, you know, uh, client management, uh, uh, you know, having um, IQ and, and emotional intelligence and, and those topics. And so in my career, I worked prior to setting up Verdi & Co. six years ago. Um, I've had the chance of working for four, uh, four different banks, uh, all well known, and all have, you know, separate sort of like um, identity and characteristics. So um, I've had the chance of starting my career with, with then a big, uh, very well known French investment bank called Paribas, which was acquired then by BNP Paribas. And I worked there in, in Singapore and in London. And those were tended to be, you know, in a, so I, I started my, my career there in finance in, in, in different different departments and, and activities, capital markets and the rest. And when I moved into, I would say, investment banking, then then tended to be more, I would say, mid-sized sort of like relationship driven uh, local uh, uh, clients and transactions. And then I was uh, uh, recruited by a, a, a big German investment bank, Deutsche Bank in London. That was in the early 2000s. And then we were very focused on, you know, sort of like sizable, very structured transactions, combining M&A, equity, debt, and, and those topics. 
um, and very, very exciting until I would say around 2005 when I was headhunted to, to join. And then, uh, you know, I would say somewhat nascent, uh, but uh, established by very well-known investment bankers, uh, a firm called Green & Co., which is a renowned independent corporate finance and m and advisor. And the bread and butter of the business here was really long-term, very re close relationship with very senior executive in corporates, most of them being sort of like FTSE 100 uh, companies or, or, or similar size if they were, were not listed. Um, and ultimately, uh, before setting up Verdi & Co, the, the, the five years before, I, I joined um, uh, a more global mid to upper mid market American investment bank called uh, Jefferies, very focused on tech and healthcare. So I think that the, the, the general theme around this is, interestingly enough, all those banks, when I joined them, they were really on the cusp of pushing and spreading their, their growth, um, yeah. either because they had relatively small operations or because they were sort of like reorganizing their, their, uh, their, their activities. And I really enjoyed being part of, you know, sort of like pushing and spreading uh, that growth and, you know, sort of like planting, planting the flag. But also, I think something that could be interesting to, for, to your, for your audience is that, you know, it's not linear and you touch upon a diversity of skill set, transaction type sectors. And that's what I really love also is that diversity. Yeah. And if, and if it wasn't for the diversity, I think, I think a lot of people in this, in this fraternity would get bored. I think if you had to um, uh, some, some people like r repetitive tasks, uh, and other people like to like to be challenged. And I think, I think sometimes there's a, there's a something in the middle as well, but I think if, if you look in your career and, and, and the attributes that you, <laughs> that you show, you like to get into, into the rough and tumble. And even, even on the advisory side, I mean, you, you do have to take on a lot on your own shoulders to make sure that, 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 that things are being delivered. I mean, you can't just go in and, and sort of just say, okay, well, let me just tell you what to do and then, and then leave, you know, you, you got to go in there and say, look, I'm a, I'm an advisor, but you know, there's stuff to be done. Let's get on with it. Let's roll up our sleeves and get on with them. And tell me a bit about that sort of a day in the life of JP and, uh, and, and, and how you actually get on with what you do. Yes. So, um, so yes, there is a lot of diversity, and I, listen, I love that question uh, because I think you you know you learn a lot by listening to other senior executives on how they describe their days, because you always pick up a few a few good tips there. Um, so I would say there is no such thing as a typical day uh, for me, at least nowadays. It was obviously different at the beginning of my career. I still do quite a few repetitive things, to be frank. Uh, but there is a lot of diversity and I do, and I do enjoy trying to find that diversity. So, um, so it's full of unexpected, but I tend to start my day, I would say around six, seven o'clock in the morning, I sort of like checking emails and sort of like clearing up a few, a few things that I can, you know, act upon, uh, put, put into, uh, into action. Um, and then I spend, uh, I do love spending quite a bit of time with my family around breakfast, school run, and then I either work, you know, from home, which is the case uh, this morning. Uh, office or obviously at clients or, or visiting clients. Mm -hmm. um, so the day tends to be packed with a lot of client advice, being a lot on the phone, being quite a bit on emails, uh, doing quite a bit of analytical work myself or working with my team on, you know, analytical work or reviewing what, what they have done, uh, managing the business, because obviously today I'm, I'm a founder. So it's about thinking about growth strategy, positioning, you know, new client development, always thinking about clients. The best moment when I think about clients is actually uh, in the morning uh, in the shower, because then I tend to have like that one or two potentially bulb uh, uh, moments. And then, you know, um, having obviously quite a few meetings and calls, it's been a lot on, on you know, uh, Teams or, or, or Zoom over the last few years. Uh, meetings do tend to, uh, I would say, to, 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 to re-emerge, but also a bit of traveling. For those that are particularly, I would say, you know, strategic, significant, and where, you know, you can't really, it's difficult to replace that, the, the personal interaction. And so one of the elements that is very attractive in our job. 
And then, I, you know, I would say that my day finishes between six and seven o'clock uh, for more family time, uh, times with friends or, or client engagement. And then most, uh, most likely then I pick up quite a few things afterwards, um, uh, whether it's, you know, clearing up a few emails or at present we've been very busy on, on a few projects. And then it's, you know, it could be working late. But uh, uh, what is really, really enjoyable nowadays and very different from my, my life in, 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 in prior firms is that, you know, it's much more flexible, it's much more balanced. Uh, and, uh, and I think it, it has an enormous amount of value in terms of, you know, enthusiasm and, and innovation in the way you think uh, creativity for your clients. Yeah, and I think I think that's that's the that's the part of the rolling up the sleeves I was I was I was alluding to because I think it's you can't just sort of sit back and 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 steer them because it's these are deep these are deep issues that you're dealing with. I mean, you you're dealing with with people in their careers. You're dealing with with organisms and organizations that feed people that you know that that has an impact in in local economies, stakeholders, investors. I mean, you name it. There, there are so many different moving parts. There's customers, there's suppliers. You're dealing with with individuals that have to make crucial decisions, and that that rolling up of the sleeves. That I, I mean, I, I I like to talk about that because it's 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 when you get involved as an advisor, you sharing in that in that journey that that client of yours is going through, isn't it? I mean, you you helping them see a different point of view. You're helping them. You're analyzing. You're looking at things. Yes, your team might crunch some numbers but like you said in the shower you have that those those aha moments i'm sure you know the 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 thinking and that and the knowledge and experience that comes from a 20 20 plus year career that for me is is magnificent in in being able to translate that into somebody's day in, in into someone's life into someone's decision making process that I, I mean that must be amazing to to actually watch some of your ideas, some of the things that 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 that, that you share, and, and watch them come to fruition. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, uh, we are an enabler of the strategy of our clients. We may be, you know, part of it, and at Verdi and Co, we are we are very much part of it. Also, because of the type of deals we do, we work a lot on you know acquisitions and buy side that can be bought on or more transformational. So we tend to be very embedded in the strategic thinking of our clients ahead of a transaction. But ultimately, I mean, it's it's the client who who makes the, the calls and the decisions, both on strategy and, you know, uh, ultimately the shape and, and form of, of a deal. Uh, but it's 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 really, really rewarding to be able to assist the client and equip them with what they need to be able to take the best decisions. Mm. I think you've pointed a lot around, you know, business. It's 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 people, it's human. And we do work in industries that are, you know, uh, very centric around mm -hmm. that. We work a lot in the tech space, uh, you know, consulting services, AI and uh, software. So it's a lot, you know, the value in those businesses is, is definitely around, around the people, right? Uh, we work a lot in, in the healthcare space, you know, medtech, biotech, specialty pharma, uh, animal health. And again, here it's it's knowledge, it's IP, it's it's people, and our third key sector remains sustainability, green tech, climate tech. And here you have people who are really also passionate about how how they can change you know the world and and help you know uh, make it a, make it hopefully a, a sustainable place to live in. Um, so yes, people are right, left, and center in in. In, in the way, you know, our clients do look at, you know, transaction, apart from obviously all the financial aspects to it, because it's it's about ensuring that their businesses are sustainable, continue to grow sustainably, profitably, and for the benefit of all their stakeholders, including employees. Do you have a, do you have a methodology? Do you have a sort of a, a... A, a, let's call it a practice, uh, a way that you that you approach a new client. I mean, let's say if someone says, "You know what, JP, come and come and do some work for us." Is there is there a, a is there a process that you follow, or do you take each one, you know, based on your experience? You start from places. Is there some some process that you, that, that you've worked out over the years that are, that's more successful than others? 
Yeah, so, uh, I mean, I'm not going to go into the details of, you know, what is a, a buy side transaction, uh, a sell side transaction, uh, an equity listing or fundraising, but here you can see certain types of, of transactions and, and obviously they have common characteristics. I think I will always start by trying to put myself in the shoes of the client, mm. which is, you know, what keeps him awake at night? Uh, and we tend to talk to, you know, CEOs, board members, chairmen, or or head of M and A, or or head of, of of business lines that could be pretty big, you know. I mean, they can be, you know, uh, you know, divisional head of of, of multi billion uh, companies that that do manage one, two, three, five billion uh, pounds of turnover. Uh, so very senior exec executives, and you know, what they tend to have on their agenda is obviously uh, strategic. It's uh, a competition. How can they be disrupted? It's it's growth. It's acquiring six uh, skill sets. It's acquiring capabilities, uh, market footprint, or it's obviously uh, in certain other extenses. It could be, you know, businesses that they have that no longer fit their portfolio uh, and where they could, you know, reallocate those resources, whether they are financials or otherwise towards other business lines. And therefore, who could be the best, you know, new owner of that business? Um, ensuring, uh, you know, obviously that they realize value, but that, uh, you know, the transaction is for, uh, you know, everybody's benefit uh, from a, you know, a human point of view, financial point of view or a reputational point of view. So thinking about, I don't, I, I don't know what, what exactly you, you meant by if we have, you know, uh, a, a set, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, methodology, um, but yeah, we uh, with experience in like in any business with experience, you you start to quite quickly understand what are the touch points and and what should be the discussion items. Because some people talk about blueprint, some people talk about you know um, this is the way we you know you know when you when you are pitching for new work or when you're doing uh, different things, uh, they say okay. Uh, I mean the the, the common thing is. Um, so, so JP, sort of, how does this work, and how much is it going to cost us? Yeah, I mean, isn't that? I mean, that's a common question. I mean, it doesn't matter what business you're in, really. Yeah. And and it's sort of the how does it work? Uh, sort of, yes, okay. Well, you know, day one we come in and we do these types of things, and day two, it's not a, it's not a, um, let's call it an exact project plan. It is more an approach, I think, that I'm asking, and and I think that's. That's what I've found. A lot, of, a lot of the really successful guys like yourself have an approach. You tend to do it naturally without even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. But you have an approach when you go to a client. I mean, I see you smiling. So I, I'd like your, your opinion on that. Yeah. So uh, again, I'll go, I'll go by the client. First, listen to the client. Mm. What has he got on his agenda? What today is, is really you know, uh, annoying him or exciting him? And how can you help him solve that that issue as an advisor? So if I were to take the example, I was just saying we do we do a lot of uh, you know buy side or acquisition uh, transactions, and we've got about four or five on on the go at present. So the sort of like topics that a client will be interested to know is, all right, how can we approach this company? Is it for sale? Would they be interested to to be acquired by us? Who else could be looking looking at it? So, what is the interlooper analysis? Uh, what do you think could be the value? How could we integrate it? What are the risks in terms of integration? What are the synergies or disynergies with that? Um, can you help us reach out to this company on a confidential, non-confidential basis? Can you help organize, you know, meetings and sort of like agendas and discussion points? How can we get traction with that? Then, do they have also a financial advisor? What sort of information could they share with us? What sort of work can we do in terms of understanding the business from a legal, operational, financial, um, HR uh, point of view, IT point of view, and uh, technology point of view? Can you help do evaluation work? Um, then that's potentially the standalone value of this business. What's the value to us? Would they accept to sell it at that price? Then what's the strategy? What's the structure? Would they sell 100% part, minority, majority? Do we want to provide an earn out? So then we get into the structuring conversation. And then you're going to take go into into obviously uh, legal aspects, access to to to, to data room, having uh, uh, them open their book, and then start to negotiate uh, uh, you know a, a, a whole raft of 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 agreements, whether it's um, a share purchase agreement, whether it's uh, 
a shareholder agreement, whether it's articles of associations, continuation, transition services agreement. And here I'm talking about obviously a private deal in a public arena as it's different, it's an offer document and those topics. And then if you think about the, the flip side, then on a, on a sell side transaction, then it's different. And if mm. it's a joint venture agreement, that's obviously different. So uh, yeah, we, of course you do have a little bit of a blue book and, and, uh, and so. But all yeah, the stuff and, and I, yeah, I'm, I'm loving that. So, so, so although, I mean, the, the approach stays roughly the same, but, it, but, but it's the, it's the, it's in the detail and, and it's the stuff that you do in the detail, which, which, which is fascinating. I think, I think one of the things this, this podcast is about post merger integration, post acquisition integration. And, and we talk a lot about how the, the setup, I mean, I, I don't know if you're a golfer, but you know, when you tee the ball up and, and you're going to take a swing at it, you know, it's like, it's, it's all the stuff you do before and, and during your swing that, that, you know, has an impact on where the ball lands eventually. Um, uh, I think other, a lot, a lot of the work that you do, you know, is buy side, sell side and so on has a massive impact on the, on, on what's possible when it comes to integration, setting the, the, let's call it the, the, the outcomes that you want from the actual deal would talk into the integration side of things. So, so tell us sort of what goes in the back of your mind. So when, when you're talking, when you're thinking about that, you're advising your client, because it's one thing to structure a really good deal, but the other part is to make it happen. Um, and, and to structure a deal that's, that's realistic, you know, and, and not just structure a deal that sounds good on paper, but difficult to implement. Tell us a little bit more about that. And it goes on in your mind. Yeah. So, um, I, I love your analogy with golf because, you know, um, a, a big parallel with, with our job is that we've got to think about the end point and then work backwards. And so PMI is a topic which, as you can easily uh, understand, because of the, I would say, the, the sectors in which we work and the type of transaction, those are acquisitions, and therefore because we are embedded really as an independent corporate finance advisor we're really embedded with our clients and we love that uh, we tend to be you know involved in those topics much more than you would in a traditional i would say pure transaction-led uh, investment banking work um, and and we really enjoy it so the reason why it is important for us as an advisor is that we want to make sure that this transaction is successful for our client and that they're happy with it. So in any shape or form where we can assist them in thinking about it and having, I would say the blueprints, you know, the action list, I mean, all these being equipped with all of that, it's important. So we think about it, but also um, uh, we want to make sure that that doesn't become a, an issue or topic at the last moment in a deal. And we've seen that quite often, you know, where in the past clients tended to think about PMI pretty much when they were, oh, actually, we're going to hold the keys of this company in a week's time. What have we thought about their future? Because everybody is very focused on the opportunity to acquire the business, doing the transaction, but then actually they are going to own it. So this is a topic which is nowadays much more at the forefront and at the very beginning of the thinking process of our clients and our thinking process than it used to be the case. 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when I started my, my career. Uh, maybe I'll just spend just one second because, um, I mean, PMI is a, is a very fast uh, topic. I mean, we are not, uh, you know, PMI experts, but as bankers, we get involved with it. And as I was saying, we, we, we think about it. And then we can think about whether, you know, the client has got the in-house capabilities or whether it, it rather also have, uh, you know, uh, take expertise from, from, from external uh, uh, professionals. But I think just for, for the audience, it's it's useful to understand that there are different PMI, you know, I would say uh, approaches. You may have the one where basically it's, it's a fully integrated acquisition. So you, you acquire the company and you almost dis, dis, dismember it or completely, you know, subdue it. Um, a company that used to do that in the past was General Electric, for instance, an extremely, you know, uh, good at it. Now things change. You have others that are, I would say, have an approach where basically it's almost fully in independent and uh, they may integrate all the time. I mean, uh, for instance, you know, um, Honeywell used to do that. 
uh, Capgemini or 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 um, uh, Accenture have got you know philosophies that are akin to that. Then you have the obviously the in between. So you may integrate certain uh, uh, you know capabilities or operations of the target company uh, and take the best from them, or you may give <clears throat> some of your own way of doing things to them. So it's a mix and match. And there is the fourth one, which you may see in certain transactions, which is actually a reverse integrate. So you're the acquirer, but actually you integrate your business line, your division or otherwise, into that new um, uh, acquisition. Yeah, and that and, and that and that's that puts another spin on it because because obviously there's there are, are other types of of deals as well that's starting to happen, and I and I love your your reverse because it it does it does mean that you almost you almost saying like I'm buying you but I'm I'm you know I'm becoming part of you and that's very interesting and but where, where the others are also quite interesting are the carve outs um and and the separations as well and and so there's it's just become such it's become such a, a science you know in a, in a way pmi and it's become such a a, a discipline that, that 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 you can't i think any executive these days needs some level of pmi on their on their resume they they need that at least at least some experience or some understanding of what PMI actually is, which I don't think was the case 20 years ago. 20 years ago, if you put PMI, people would say, what, what is that? <laughs> and now it's sort of, wow, okay, well, it's almost, a, it's also almost a requirement because most businesses these days, especially with the fast moving environments like tech and, 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 and sort of your environmental things, there's a lot of, a lot of activity. You know, it's not always great activity because sometimes, you know, there's some really bad uh, you know, uh, let's say uh, choices that are made, but they, you know, they, there's it, it, there's constant talk about how do we grow. I mean, there's really only two ways if you think about. It. I mean, we either spend money at sales and marketing, or we go and buy other companies. You know, how do we actually expand our entity geographically or with tech or with staff? I mean, finding really good people. Sometimes it's just much easier just to buy another company and take their employees and put them onto your payroll because you just can't, just the whole recruitment process is so very, very difficult these days. Um, so there's, there's so many different reasons why. And, I'm, and I'm, I love your, 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 um, your, your relation to sort of, you, you got to be thinking, and, and that's, that's the whole, that whole golf analogy. You got to think about where your ball's got to land. I mean, it doesn't help. You're on the on the uh, green and you're putting and you take out your driver. You know, I mean, that's not going to end up in the hole and, and vice versa. You're not going to take your putter and, and tee off with it. Well, I mean, unless you, you, you know, you've had maybe too much to drink. But I think the, the whole the whole thing is, is it's you have to really understand the entire uh, journey that's that's coming. And also, what needs to be uh, achieved. So, I'm 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 liking that. I'm I'm liking that whole approach. Uh, you do get involved. I mean, you do very much get involved with with your clients. And and with, coming from an investment banking point of view, the buy and sell side knowledge and experience would be huge because that's what you do as investment bankers, isn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. you do you analyze. Uh, whether deals are good or not, and whether you want whether you want to pitch that deal to be done. Often, as big in investment banking firms, you'd, you'd go to to the two firms and say, "How about the two of you get together and have a conversation, and we'll we'll put the deal together for you?" Isn't that mm -hmm. investment mm -hmm. banking? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And, and you would have done hours worth of our clients. Yeah, exactly. You would have done hours worth of analysis and research and all that to see, you know, what if we put that one and that one and that one of those together. In fact, together they mean this, or if we start splitting that one out, carving, you know, it becomes a bit like a chess game if you if you think about it. I Absolutely. mean, I just that that's why I'm finding it fascinating speaking to you today because although you don't spend that much time on the PMI, you spend a lot of time on the setup of that of that the rest of the journey. Um, is that a fair enough uh, assessment of 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 the of, of what you do? 
Yeah, listen, you're you're spot on. I think you're completely spot on. I mean, you 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 made you made references to you know senior executives not having PMI experience twenty years ago and nowadays being you know right, left, and and center. Uh, I mean, uh, for instance, I, I mean just two transactions we're working on today in the tech space. Uh, one is exactly what you're mentioning. It's a carve out in the Nordics for in the top, in the IT space, and that's sorry, that's the reason why I was a bit late on 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 the call. And and you know the conversation is effectively you know in the carve out. What is it that they are going to put in the basket? How are we going to think about integration? How are we going to think about topics around you know cultural alignment, uh, motivation, retention of employees? And you 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 mentioned, for instance, you know how how tight the labor market can be for you know very skilled you know uh, software and and AI engineers. So those are are, are key topics. And they need to be really, you know, set from 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 day one uh, to make sure that this is successful. And that, you know, the the infamous um, uh, probability of success of uh, an M and A transaction being ten tended to be, you know, referred to be in the 50, 60 percent historically. Mm -hmm. Well, that for our client, we make sure this is an 80, 90 percent uh, scenario because the PMI topic has been thought through uh, well ahead. Yeah, and I think I think it's now become critical. I mean, you you got to have that as part of your conversation. In in, in the past, I I'd, I'd always got the sense that due diligence and during that whole initial process was all about understanding the structure of the deal, but never really giving enough thought to the how. It's like almost more about the what and not so much about the how. These days, it's a lot more about not just the what, but about the how and and the who and 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 all the tools and the processes and things we need to follow and how and who we need to get on board mm -hmm. because do you bring external teams do you build your own internal team are you going to become you know are you doing are you doing serial acquiring uh or is this a one-off you know i mean are there are, could be a, a many many reasons or do we do regular do we, or do we set it that we will only do one a year or one every three years you know if i look at um one of the the software vendors that's quite well known in, in in the UK. I see they've recently done done an acquisition, but they hadn't done one now for about four years, I think. Um, and it's it's a very slow. I mean, I would have thought the tech space would have would have been a lot more acquisitive for that particular space. But it's almost like there's there's this hesitancy for some entities to get into that, and then there's other entities that are. A lot more hungry to acquire. I mean, it's like we got to. It's like this, this drug. It's like this deal heat, if you like. And and uh, and I mean, you probably see that and, and and advise on that as well. Yeah. So, I mean, on on this one, I pro probably two 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 answers. Uh, yeah. I mean, clients have got a diversity of M and A culture, appetite, expertise. Uh, for a variety of reasons, um, and therefore it's important that when when we work with our clients, that do, we do realize, you know, what is that level of knowledge and expertise that they have, and how we can best fit. Some clients, you know, are extremely versed with it. Do you know relentless M and A? That's part of that's em, that's embedded uh, to in their business model, and therefore you know we come with a certain set of services. In terms of supporting them there we have a lot of clients where you know uh the the m a uh culture and expertise can be more recent um but giving you an example i mean we are we've been working with a, about a two billion uh, turnover international uh, faci integrated facilities management company that is owned by a big private equity firm and you know they've had m a on in the back of their mind for a few years but the new private equity firm is is obviously extremely well established. It's a 20, 30 billion fund. They know MA, doing you know, bolt on recurring bolt on is part of, of, of their way of thinking. And you know, they are really providing and recruiting, you know, experts like you know, uh, M head of MA and and so within their organization and pushing uh, the MA um, uh, strategy uh, very, you know, very, very significantly. Uh, it's almost like you know a, a project every month or two months that that they have, 
and they bring that that, that PMI uh, knowledge. But for the example you just gave of a company that you know may do M and A on an on and off basis, that's where I think they they ought to if they don't, um, you know, uh, call upon uh, PMI experts, consultants, independent ex- consultants that can assist them in thinking about it ahead, but but certainly also implement it. The second part is, for me, where I've seen clients being very successful is ensuring that there is accountability in when they do transactions at senior executive level. And there there is continuity in the leadership uh, uh, on the transaction. So from during the transaction and afterwards, and not that it completely drops the ball, where it is quite often the case, for instance, for external advisors like bankers, but within the company, that shouldn't be the case. And that's where PMI experts and consultants can help. Yeah, I, I also, and, and this is the last point around around this, is I've also seen that when you got an entity that does a lot of a lot of acquisitions, um, it also changes the nature of their own organization because they they tending now to, um, it's a bit like, I mean, you've seen it. Uh, you have a board, right? You have an executive. They are a good team and they work very, very well together. Now, one of the members leave and it get replaced by someone else. The dynamic starts to change, doesn't it? Now you have another person leave, another person, another person to replace. Now the dynamic changes again, be- just because of the nature of bringing new people on board. When you're an acquisitive firm, you are, you're not just, I mean, there's a, often, it depends on how deep the integrations are, of course, but you are sort of cross uh pollinizing if you if that's if i could use that word but you are doing a lot of that across the organizations that over time the acquiring entity theoretically and you must just tell me what your experience is but theoretically will start experiencing changes even within themselves because they'll be taking on management their management will be joining other entities and you start having this i've seen i've seen entities start start diluting too much where they take all their really good managers and place them out in out in the marketplace and they have fewer managers managing the actual the main the core business have you seen that i mean i, I i've seen that and then 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 things start to fall over uh especially you know you only realize it later on or much later on as things start unraveling yeah. any, any experience on that yeah, so I don't know if uh, what I'm going to tell you really answer your question, but from a, my perspective as an M&A advisor, it is critical that uh, you know that the management team in the company that well that, that our client may be looking at acquiring, or that we may be advising to sell, remains focused on their business, because a transaction can be you know it is. It is highly time consuming. It diverts management from their day-to-day business. Uh, it, it pulls resources from loads of different areas within an organization. And it's important that what I would call the assets, the subject of the transaction is not being damaged because the management team take their eyes off the ball. So I don't know if that quite an- answers your question, but it's it's a way to, to say, you know, recognizing the value of people and, and human beings and managers in terms of you know having the ability to focus on the business and having the right skill set to manage that business and drive it. Mm. Now that's a very valid point. And that's exactly the answer I was looking for is, is 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 there's a lot to be said about focus. There's a lot to be said about sticking to the knitting, if you like, or sticking to your day job and sticking to what you're good at. Because if you get too many additional tasks, you know, unfortunately, we, we only have that many attention units, if you like, in a day. There's only so much that you can do. And as a management team, sometimes the really good managers often get stretched, um, you know, past their ability to, to be effective. And, and, and I've, I've, I've seen that as well. So, so I think as an advisor, and this is where I'm coming back to, to you, and, and I want to then talk a little bit about your company, because we're coming close to the to the hour now. As an advisor, I'm sure these are some of the conversations you're having. You're saying, guys, we 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 would need to think about you know the old transaction and all that, but let's just let's think about the teams, let's think about the people, let's think about 
you know, the team we're acquiring, let's think about your management team. Let's think about all those those elements because the only way we're going to create value out of this transaction is if we have these and these and these things in place. Would you agree with that as a as a premise? Completely, completely. So, I mean, the way I would say I, it transcribes uh, very practically in my in my job is to ensure that leaders do meet. So between, you know, the acquiring company and the target company uh, or the business we're selling with their potential, you know, new investors and, and, and shareholders that they meet, that they have the opportunity, you know, to sort of like socialize on a personal uh, point of view that they can exchange on, you know, strategy, business and and so, but that that also sort of like permeates within the organization during you know transaction and due diligence process, mm. and then obviously in the way we sort of like you know kick off uh, processes, making sure again that we've got the resources and capability on our side. So meaning that our clients is thinking how he's going to handle it and uh, what that means, uh, and pool resources at the different stages. You know we've got to think about confidentiality and you know that sort of topics and avoiding rumors. But also that you know he thinks about the sort of like external advisors that he may may want to have if he doesn't have either the bandwidth or the knowledge or skill set whether it's you know a financial due diligence advisor an accounting due diligence advisor a tech advisor an hr advisor a pmi and, and so on so that you know we are we are a good good strong team that may evolve over time to make sure that uh, you know it, it becomes a, a a successful project so, so tell us a bit about your team. Tell us a bit about your company, what you do, how can people get hold of you, sort of where, you know, what's the kind of clients that you're looking for and, and, and so on? Yeah, sure. Uh, so very, very happy to do that. So listen, first of all, I'll start with the team. I've got an absolutely amazing team that has been growing over the last uh, few years. So the firm was set up six years ago. We do business in, in, in the UK and France, meaning actually where most of our clients are or the assets of a transaction. So it can be, you know, UK, UK, inbound UK. It can be UK outside, France similarly. So it can be a permutation of that. But we do recognize that part of our skill set is to be, you know, on the ground. Uh, you know, I've been doing investment banking for plus 20 plus years in, in the UK, but also in France and other jurisdiction. But, <clears throat> you know, we've got a, we've got a team of, of 10, 10 colleagues, variety, a variety level of, of seniority. I like to call it, you know, a bit the United Corps of Benetton because we speak probably nine, ten languages, um, a variety of skill set. Um, mm -hmm. And that allows us to do, I would say, so as what I was saying, buy side MA, sell side MA, fundraising, a lot of strategic uh, uh, work in the background, like, you know, Bain and Co. with the, the corporate finance hat on. And we've been extremely successful also in helping our clients doing very, very detailed. Uh, target scoping uh, acquisition exercises and, and mapping, and sometimes helping them doing the, the outreach. But like, so, you know, that, that independence and, and, and long-term uh, mindset is, is very, very much enshrined within, within the way we do business. And we work for corporates, tend to be big corporates, but also they could be, you know, listed, they could be private equity owned, they could be owner, founder owned, and uh, more, uh, more specifically, with a couple of private equity uh, funds on a selective uh, basis. Oh, that's great! And then, how, how would how, how do people get hold of you, JP? How do you, you know, how well, do you get hold of you? Very easy. We're all very open-minded. So, first of all, I would say just you know have a look at our website www.verdienco.com. V e r d i e r a n d c o dot com. Uh, please do follow us on, on LinkedIn. You can you can uh, search us there and just reach out to us on, on via via LinkedIn messages. And don't hesitate to reach out to any of my colleagues, not only me. Um, we are you know uh, we are very keen to hear from you know potential candidates. Uh, we are going to you know scale up further the firm with some senior and very senior recruits. So always happy to engage in those dialogues. Uh, but candidates mm -hmm. or just to do business together, or if you're a service provider. Uh, we are very tech and, and uh, digitally savvy. So if you have uh, propositions that could be relevant to our business, yeah, very, very keen to hear. Love it. Thank you very much. JP, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate you coming online and I know you're very, very busy. And, and um, that's why I started a little bit earlier because I, I knew you'd come online at least sometime uh, while we were talking. We <laughs> finished de dead on time uh, tw at 12 p.m. 
you can pop onto your next meeting now, which I'm sure you've got lined up. But JP, thank you very much. It's been fascinating getting to know you and your company. Um, we've had a previous conversation as well, which I thoroughly enjoyed. I, I really want you to be on the show again at some stage in the future. Maybe next time we ca we cover one or two case studies and and just share some a few different things with with the audience. But fascinating talking to 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 someone who's got the a really good background in this investment banking buy side sell side and 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 teeing up again using my go golf an analogy <laughs> the right kind of PMI go going for it and and I like your concept around eighty percent is is what you're aiming to to get in terms of success, in terms of value creation, et cetera. JP, thank you very, very much. Much appreciated. My pleasure. I really enjoyed the conversation also. And uh, let's keep in touch. And I wish you a good day as well as uh, all your audience. Thank you very much. All the best. Thank you. My, um, my I'm going to say goodbye to the audience and then and then we'll catch up with you again sometime. Thank, thanks, JP. Very good. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, everyone, thank you very much for joining us for another episode of 100 Days and Beyond, the uh, the podcast that dedicates um, time and energy and effort to those special in the individuals, those those wonderful people out there that that do so much for business, for for making this entire economy of 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 the world that we live in, the the the, the economy that pays our bills, puts roofs over our heads, feeds our families. And, 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 and makes things happen um, in the right kind of way. I think people are getting smarter, savvier, and we have people such as JP that come online within this environment, bringing in a wealth of experience, knowledge, and advice to, to clients to be able to deliver on the outcomes that, that, that are needed to be able to continuously grow and develop as markets change, as human uh, humankind changes and as we become better and more sustainable over over time thank you very much for joining us today hope to see you on the next episode of 100 days and beyond have a fantastic weekend and we'll chat to you again bye bye hi everybody this is dudley again and if you need help with a future or existing post-merger integration i want to invite you to arrange a free no obligation meeting with us during the meeting, we'll find out exactly what you need, what your challenges are, and we'll explain how our unique PMI slipstream method can help you. Simply call us or visit mergerintegration.co.uk. That's mergerintegration.co.uk or come to our website, skillfulpursuit.com.